Well, thank you for singing out to our Heavenly Father. It's nice to hear your, your pretty voices. I could really hear you, Henry. Good job. You know, a pretty common understanding is that unless you truly stand for something, you will probably fall for anything. And this is certainly true in the protection and growth of our Christian lives, that we must take a firm stand on the things that we believe in, or our Christianity really won't amount to much. In other words, the one thing every Christian must possess is conviction. All Christians must take a stand and be willing to be counted for Christ. And it is this lack of decisiveness and conviction which is so common among so many so-called believers in many churches today. Now don't get me wrong, it's not that people are all out against Christ, it's, it's rather that they are, they're just not really all out for Christ. And unfortunately, it just seems to be too easy to be uninterested, unmoved, and lukewarm in our relationship to Jesus and in our lives as a Christian. I was at the seminary a couple weeks ago and I heard a professor at the school telling a student, he said, well, if you're going to be a Christian, just make sure you're a good one. Now this does seem kind of like a strange contradiction, doesn't it? To insinuate that there might be anything besides a good Christian. But tragic to say, it is true. There are many who claim to be Christians who are not good Christians. They lack determination. They lack conviction. They are like the person who finally confesses that they've been a Christian for many years, but nobody's found out about it yet. You see, the increasing pace of worldliness and pleasure within our society today makes it extremely difficult to become or remain a Christian. Many of the ideas found within our contemporary world conflict radically with true biblical teaching. The emphasis which the world makes upon life and its aims and its goals and its desires are completely and utterly opposed to the Christian faith and the Christian religion. The problem here is that often the one who is in step with the world is way out of step with God. You see, when we become a Christian, we must undergo a complete change of ideas. This requires a complete reversal of our current direction. Not only in our thinking, but in our daily actions, how we live our lives. The worldly things we used to love become the things we now dislike. And the things which we once believed in, often with passion, we now oppose. Being a Christian then means the beginning of a constant struggle within one's self, if you will, to remain a Christian. So the difficult task for us Christians because of sin is to continue to be Christians. That is the lifelong task and the lifelong struggle that we all are confronted with. You see, Christianity is a serious thing. It cannot be taken lightly or with a grain of salt. Some might think it doesn't take much to become a Christian, but I will tell you, it takes all that there is of the person to become one. You see, God demands the whole heart. God demands the whole person. God demands the whole personality. God demands us to stand up for Jesus. To stand up and be soldiers of the cross. You see, our allegiance to God must be total 
and complete. And membership in the body of Christ, not only for the pastor, but for every real believer, begins with the call of God. Every single church member, every single believer, every single person here today is under the same call to discipleship from the same Lord. Every single one of you here today is under just as much of a call as I am. Every one of you. You may not have been ordained by an official affiliation, but you have certainly been ordained by the Lord for ministry in his body. And that is no less significant than mine. As Christians, we are called upon to be witnesses for Christ. We are urged to be all out for God and the things of God. It is demanded of us that we be men and women of conviction. We are called to stand up for Jesus. Christ, Christ emphasized the seriousness of our Christian calling in our text today. We are confronted with some very serious issues in the matter of being an out-and-out, full-blown, witnessing Christian. These words will not allow any of us to take lightly this extremely important matter of being a Christian. And as we study today, we will learn why it is so necessary to be a real, a genuine, a loving, a bold, and a caring, witnessing Christian if we intend to be a Christian at all. Today's reading can be found in the book of Luke, chapter 12, beginning with verse 4 through verse 12. Will you please rise out of respect for the word. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not. You are of more value than many sparrows. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. These are your holy words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us in your truth. Your word is the only truth. Please be seated. Well, we can plainly see, as we read through the text, it clearly stresses the seriousness of our Christian calling, doesn't it? Those of us who make every effort to live Christian lives are being warned in this text by Christ this morning to be on our guard against the sneaky dangers that can damage the new life that is inside of us. And looking at this message with complete clarity and true understanding, there is no possible way any of us can ever understand anything different than what our role is as servants of Christ and what his calling on our lives really means. Besides, you know, God, he knows all about us. He deeply cares for us. He treasures your soul. We are extremely valuable to him. He loves us tremendously. We're valuable to him. So let's be as valuable to him as he commands us to be. And let's learn from his word this morning the truth found within this lesson today. I'm going to have four points in this lesson. First of all, 
Each of us has the responsibility over ourselves. Within the message, Jesus tells us in no uncertain terms that we have a soul to take care of. Luke 12, verses 4 and 5 reads, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. But those aren't the things really to fear, says Jesus, because in verse 4, it says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But the big thing to be feared is God himself. God himself has the power to put you and me into hell because of a denial of Christ and not taking care of our soul. It is extremely important for the Christian to be vitally interested in developing his or her spiritual life, to be the highest possible level so that their souls might be free from corruption. We must always be on the lookout against deceptive influences that would drive our hearts away from Christ. And my friends, the company we keep certainly plays a vital role in determining the depth of our spirituality, especially in the case of young people. I mean, it applies to everyone for sure, but especially young people. The so-called friend is sometimes the worst enemy because they often entice our souls to sin and pull us away from God. Take my own life for an example. I know I was called a long time ago to serve God. I would have been a pastor many years, many years ago, if I would have not associated with the people that I did associate with. And that applies to you too. Peer pressure is powerful. The company a person keeps could very well keep you out of heaven. The activities that we all indulge in oftentimes makes or breaks our Christian life. You see, we must realize that the things that we do are bound to affect the things that we believe. If a person, if a person claims to believe in Christ, but never witnesses to anyone about it, about the glorious salvation found only in Jesus, or if they never practice their faith, they won't be a Christian very long. Remember the saying, practice what you preach? You've all heard that, right? Well, this is a must in the development of your Christian life. And we are to practice our Christianity. We must learn to say no to temptation and learn to walk away from it when it presents itself in our lives. You see, each one of us is vulnerable to the enticements of the world in which we live. When the world calls, it can be very easy for some of us to say, yes. But I will tell you, the only thing the world can offer you is the final and complete destruction of your soul. Whether the temptation is drugs or drunkenness, telling a lie, losing your temper, flying off the handle, getting angry, cheating your neighbor, unfaithfulness, cursing and swearing, etc., etc., etc. We must learn the vital lesson that there are things, if indulged in, have the power to cast your soul into hell. As Jesus says in our text today, we must fear these things and stay away from them. 
We must stand up for Jesus. Secondly, each one of us has a responsibility over others. And this is the reason why we need to be real witnessing Christians. It is one of the great points of emphasis within Scripture that God wants Christ and the religion that he taught known. And this emphasis is also found in our text today. Luke 12, 8 and 9. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before the men will be denied before the angels of God. The issue is pretty clear. God wants us to be his witnesses for the people in the world. He wants us to bring them to Christ. And naturally, it takes a real sanctified Christian to do that. In fact, here's how important our witness is. God has left it in the hands of Christians to evangelize the world. Christians are his agents to bring the gospel to others. If they fail, if we fail, Christianity fails. And this should make it very clear to you and to me that this job is not for slackers. This job is not for lukewarm church members. This job is not for dried up, sour religionists. Rather, this is a job for sanctified, all out, witnessing, bold, loving, on fire for the Lord Christians who love Jesus Christ and are not ashamed to say so. You see, when it comes to the matter of the Christian life, we are called upon to be examples for others. Now that example sometimes will come from word of mouth and sometimes by deed, how we live our lives. If we are truly saved believers in Jesus, the last thing any one of us would ever want to hear from somebody about our Christian life would be, them? They're Christian? Really? Man, I know them pretty well. And they've never said a word to me about it. Hmm. I never would have known that. I'm really surprised. And sadly, sometimes it is in the matter of confessing and witnessing to others about Jesus Christ that many church members fall down. Yet this is our greatest responsibility once we say we believe in Jesus. As Christians, we are to show others the way by our example. This in itself is a very powerful witness. No person should be able to ever look at you and say, you're a Christian? Really? They should automatically know it by the life that you live. So what's the point here? Go tell your neighbor. Go tell your friends. Tell everyone you know, even the strangers that you bump into at the grocery store. Tell them about Jesus Christ and what he did for them. Share the glorious message of salvation with the world. Talk about spiritual things. Confess your faith. Stand up against the crowd by upholding Christ. Let your life show others that you love your Lord and Master Jesus Christ. Never deny Jesus to anyone. Christ demands our open confession of our faith in him. He demands it. And taking a definite stand, a definite witnessing stand for Christ carries with it great reward. Luke 12, 8. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. 
If you confess Christ, Christ will confess you before the angels of God. Your name will be cause for rejoicing in heaven. Your life will have divine approval. You will be looked upon as one of God's own. Can you imagine, really imagine, being one of God's own? That's powerful. Under his care and his love to be one of God's own. So for every witness you make for your Lord, remember God stands behind it. A third point. But to be very, very clear, there are grave dangers attached to our failure to be real witnessing Christians. You see, God created us to serve him and to stand up for Jesus Christ. We are meant to be witnesses. That's our purpose here on this planet. Therefore, if we ignore or shirk our responsibilities, there are logical consequences. The first is to be denied by Jesus himself. In verse 9, but the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. You see, the message here is if you fail to witness, if you fail to stand up for Jesus Christ, don't expect help from God. He will deny you too. And this is a very strong warning to the self-satisfied church member who makes no attempt to confess Christ to others. You see, it is possible through our failure to witness for Christ to become so hardened to the call of God that we also sadly harden ourselves to the Holy Spirit's work. A person can resist God for just so long. They will finally arrive to a place, a state of sin, if you will, from which there is no return. In verse 10b, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. This is a warning to all of us that God's patience is exhaustible, that it runs out in the matter of a person's faith. You see, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is the persistent and unrepentant resistance against the work of the Holy Spirit and his message concerning Jesus Christ as Lord. And this applies to the person who continues in hardening of their heart against God. The one who hardens their heart against the work of the Holy Spirit and against the provision of Christ as the only Savior. So this then is outside of the reach of God's providing for forgiveness and salvation. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is flagrant, willful, and persistent rejection of God and his commands. This sin is committed today only by those who deliberately and unchangeably reject the ministry of the Holy Spirit in calling them into salvation. So unless you practice your faith, that faith will die. And in its place will come unbelief and the hardened heart that fails to seek God. No more interest. I gotta tell you, there are many tragic cases of former church members who have drifted away from God. And some of them now, I'm afraid, are beyond the reach of the Holy Spirit's call because of years of neglect of a faith that once was real. And there is nothing sadder than the person who once was a Christian but now has fallen away. You see, the backslider constitutes a major problem because they have tasted of the fruits of glory but have allowed themselves to grow lax and uncaring in the things of Christ.
But if you know someone in this category, your call is to wake them up before it's too late. They may not have another day on this earth. Wake them up, no matter who they are. So the sad fact is, and we never want to be fooled into thinking otherwise, whoever continually resists the Holy Spirit and rejects the gospel will go into the lake of fire. Eternal hell. Scripture's clear. And for those of us here today, may we be awake to our Christian calling. May we be alert to our Christian calling. May we be alive in our faith. May we be witnessing Christians so that the slumber and unimportance and neglect never catch up to us or never be a part of our lives. My last point. As witnessing Christians and believers in Christ we need not be afraid. We don't need to fear any types of persecution, any kind of things we might face in our world for being followers of Jesus Christ, who is the only way to eternal life. And my friends, America is starting to persecute Christians. Wake up. It's happening. It is starting to happen in our lifetime, which tells me, I believe, that Christ will soon be here. So wake up. If you're sleeping, Luke 12, 11 and 12 reads, And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. And in Luke 21, 14 and 15, Settle it, therefore, in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. And in Matthew 10, 19 and 20, when they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. You see, when we stand up for Jesus Christ and witness to others about him, we have absolutely nothing to fear. As children of our Heavenly Father, we have nothing to fear. And one of my favorite sections in the Bible which gives me strength and should strengthen any Christian's determination to never be afraid to witness boldly for Christ's sake. Matthew 5, 10 through 13. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So boldly stand up to your commitment to Almighty God. Never be ashamed of who you are. You and I are called into service by Almighty God himself, and we have nothing to fear. What an honor it is to be a Christian. What an honor it is to be called into his service as a calling from Almighty God. My friends, there is no use trying to be a Christian unless at the same time you try to be the best one possible. To be a Christian is not a cheap, scrawny religion. The true religion of Jesus Christ is a vital, dynamic mission for the Lord. It involves at all times your best efforts. It calls for priority over all else in your life and in your thinking. It calls for complete dedication of self. Jesus wants our witness. 
Christ commanded our witness to go out into the world to save others from burning in hell. And what every church should preach. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. I pray we all listen to the words of Christ and his commands. I pray that we take our Christian calling as serious as it is intended to be. I pray that we desire in our hearts to, t to take the clear message of salvation to our lost and dying world so that they too can experience the love and the care and the compassion of Jesus who is the only way to eternal life. Be strong in your faith. Be soldiers of the cross. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. Let's pray. Glorious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you do for us. Your directions are clear for Christians. I ask that you allow the Holy Spirit to penetrate deep into the hearts of everyone who hears my voice today, that they make a firm commitment to change their lives if needed, and to go out into the world and bring others into your kingdom. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for us on the cross and shed his innocent body and blood so that we could be saved. You are the only way to salvation, Lord. Thank you for being there with us. Thank you for giving us the power of your spirit to stand boldly and to stand up for Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.